Hello, everyone. My name is Marita Mall, and I am the ALAC representative for NA Rallo. Uh, and I'm going to speak today about the um, public forum at ICANN 73, which was on the topic of the global public interest framework. Now, uh, this is framework is still a pilot and it's very new still being explored uh, by the community. And um, this was not the first session on this issue uh, at the previous ICANN, I guess ICANN 72. There was a review uh, which described what this framework was about and um, how it was going to be used. Just to put it very briefly, the public interest framework is a way for the board to um, try to evaluate how the global public interest is served in some of its in some of the recommendations it's asked to review and approve uh, and this is this is all done within the founding documents of ICANN the bylaws the articles of incorporation where the global public interest is actually mentioned a lot but um, in the various types of reviews that the community has done, trying to define, the, actually define the global public interest, it's just too many things to too many people. So putting it in this particular framework helps the board to make some kind of evaluation around that without getting into the wider discussion about what is the global public interest. So that's the frame. And that is the frame we were talking about at this particular session. Has to be confined and not go outside of the framework discussion. We had at the session, we had Ergus Ramai, who is the staff person um, who worked on uh, this particular uh, project and Avery Doria, who is the board member who I think she's the shepherd of this um, framework, certainly the person who's mostly coming forward and speaking about it. Ergus did um, a review of the, the what's happening with the framework right now and how it's set up and, you know, and the fact that it is a pilot being tested, but did a very good job of explaining how the board was using it. And Avery, again, uh, she, she explored that further uh, and um, let me stay here. Um, definitely saying that, you know, it was a way for the board to operationalize um, the global public interest issue in a way that could be contextualized. I know those are big words, but it's kind of a way of just uh, putting it all uh, into a frame that the board could actually deal with. Um, it's a structure. It's a process. And it does not change anything at all about the bottom-up uh, process that ICANN works on. It doesn't change the recommendations. It's just a way to evaluate how those recommendations fit in to the global public interest. And um, we had, uh, after hearing from Ergus and Avery, we had um, uh, three panel members from the community, uh, Justin Q from the ALAC, uh, at large community who was uh, speaking in her role as the head of a small team who um, actually was one of the first users of the global public interest framework in trying to respond to some board questions on uh, sub pro um, recommendations uh, or suggestions that um, uh, that were part of an advice um, from ALAC to the board. Uh, Bellamira Grau was the uh, government advisory committee um, representative and she is um, she's from the European uh, community. Uh, and uh, she's the European Commission's representative on the GAC actually. And there was Paul McGrady who is um, who is was the former ICANN GNSO counselor representing the IP community constituency and is now on the um, on the NOMCOM 
uh, and has been involved in ICANN for a very long time. So these are three people who definitely um, were well-versed well and able to answer a number of questions. Uh, some of the questions, um, I, had, I honestly thought that this was 90 minute session. We were going to <laughs> sort, of, sort of have too much time and have to end early. That was not the case. We were rushing to try to get through some of the really um, good thoughts that uh, the community, the panelists had, plus the questions that were coming from the community uh, who were uh, attending the session. Um, we were up to 300 at least. Uh, I might just add that a public forum is one that has no uh, no conflict. So um, everybody who was at uh, ICANN 73 had an opportunity to attend this without it conflicting with um, another session that they should have or wanted to go to. So the numbers were pretty high, three to 400 at times, and uh, we were able to um, take a few questions as well. Um, in response to some of the, to, to the questions that, that Justine um, took, what challenges did you see in applying the framework? Because as I said, she had actually done some attempt at application of it. Um, she said that it was, uh, she was able to, um, she found it usable, actually, you know, practical enough that it could be used. Um, let's see now, uh, checking my notes here. Um, she also found that it was clearly directed at the board and uh, if there was an expectation and there is hope that the community would also use this tool before things went to the board, she felt that there was going to have to be more direction or ability for the community to do that. And um, she's also wondering about how that such decisions would be in the end evaluated or monitored. Um, Paul, Paul McGrady um, had the question, to what extent does the framework serve the ICANN community needs? Uh, and uh, he was, um, he mentioned a few things like uh, he was a little concerned that it would enable the community to try to bring forward questions that had already been negotiated in a PDP process, what's called taking a second bite of the apple. Um, he was also had a concern on the other end of the spectrum where it would just become a check bar, check bar, uh, box. Uh, and not um, really a useful consideration. Uh, and so we don't know yet uh, that it, you know, how that's going to work. And, and he's quite correct in that it's new and it's only going to be up to us to how we work it out. Um, Bellamira, how will this framework help the community evaluate relevant GPI, re the relevant global public interest on any given issue. Um, Bellamira thought that it was a valuable monitoring tool, um, also helping with accountability, uh, that it would help the community overcome the difficulties of finding definition of the GPI. As I said before, that's been tackled before, and this is a way of putting it into a context. So. Um, that was a that was a, a, a good comment. Um, she was hoping that it would evolve to a principle based uh, a principle based tool, which was not going to be too onerous for the community, because already the community is is weighed down with an enormous amount of work. So, not adding to that work is another goal, um, and also a concern about what might not be there or how would negatives be addressed. Um, there were other really interesting and excellent, excellent comments that came out of it. Uh, one of them uh, was that um, in order to, uh, it, it was Justine really, I think, who said that in order to make this more usable, that the uh, Global public interest framework ought to be considered when um, 
project or PDPs are actually scoped. So that is all in there, that, that those considerations are in there from the very beginning. And uh, it will be easier for everyone to apply them as they go through. Um, and um, also to the question of, is there a wider use to this? Um, everybody mostly thought, yes, there was, but uh, who, when, and how were still questions that we were not able to ask. Uh, I think um, I went through the whole session last night and I think that the staff and the board who are working and, 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 and fine tuning this probably got a lot out of this session. There were many comments, many really good suggestions. And uh, I think it was, I think it was very successful in the end. And uh, I might add, um, and at large, um, uh, uh, idea that was brought forward through through the vetting process that goes into uh, who where the where the uh, public how the public forums uh, at any ICANN meeting um, evolve. So um, I think it was a successful, and uh, and I how how uh, things would go forward uh, we'll see. There's no immediate suggestion that there be another one. I think it's too soon that there be another evaluation of the global public interest framework in the next ICANN meeting. But maybe after that, um, we'll we'll get a chance to look at it again with a little more evidence that um, something is working or not working. And uh, I think that's it for me. Thank you for listening. I hope you found it useful. Uh, and um, see you, hopefully, some of you uh, in The Hague in the spring. Fingers crossed. Bye now. Okay, I don't see any hands. So, Naela, if you're around, uh, you're next. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, Naela. I have Jonathan. Uh, uh, his son is up. Yeah, of course. Go ahead, Jonathan. And thank you. Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, Jonathan Zook here for the record. I just thought I would um, raise the possibility that uh, the discussion that's taking place um, right currently between the uh, GNSO and GAC uh, is about closed generics um, because back in 2012, when um, the, the, the last round of new GTLD applications took place, a number of people applied for um, strings for, for, for top level domains that were generic terms like uh, books or perfume or something and um, but but to be controlled by a single company and that that became controversial and the GAC objected and said the only uh, way in which those types of top level domains should be allowed is if they operate in the public interest so I wonder if it will be interesting to have um, part of that discussion filtered through um, the global public interest framework, um, because that will that conversation is going to be passed back to the board for evaluation once they've completed it. So, anyways, I, I just thought of it as a potential uh, additional uh, use for the public interest framework. Yeah, well, I, I in the previous meeting that we were talking about the uh, planification for ICANN 74, I think, Jonathan, you were the one that uh, mentioned uh, to have a, uh, some kind of policy session on, around this thing of closed generics. Do you think it would be possible to intersect some of these uh, public interest framework ideas within that session? I, I mean, it might be. I, I mean, it's a very... Uh... Early, very early thought about it, but that okay. could provide um, a framework, <laughs> okay. if you will, if you will, for uh, our own discussions about what we believe would be a, a compromise on closed generics that uh, um, falls within the global public interest. So it requires some more thought, but it's a possibility. Okay, we will keep thinking about it. Hadia, you have a hand up. Hadia. Hi, yes, uh, this is Hadia for the record. And um, I, I raised my hand also to, um, to, to speak about the public, uh, the public interest framework and, uh, and closed generic. 
and um, Jonathan did actually in the previous uh, call in the planning committee um, suggest a closed uh, generics policy um, session. I think it's a great idea. Uh, but my question is, could actually the framework uh, be used uh, for the purpose of identifying if a um, uh, top level domain is in the public interest or not? Like, does the framework include the ability or capability um, for that? Um, I, I'm not sure. Like, was it developed with this in mind or uh, was it more oriented or only oriented towards policy? And my, my question maybe well, is to uh, Marita. Uh, well, we have Abri Doria here, which is, uh, is the uh, shepherd of this. Uh, um, Abri, Abri, can you uh, uh, say something about this question? <clears throat> Um, sure. Hi, Aubrey speaking. Um, <clears throat> I wasn't planning to speak. Um, <laughs> and okay. was just chewing on something when you called me. So, okay. um, theoretically, yes. I mean, basically, at the framework is put together at the moment to allow the board a sort of set of tools that they can use on any policy recommendation. And the, the generic, um, you know, a solution to that, if there is one, based on the fact that you know there was the non-policy and then there was advice against it, is something that would have to go back to the GNSO. They would have to make a policy recommendation based on that solution and, and, and certainly. And, and so can it, <clears throat> we're still testing it. So how well it can be used you know, remains to be seen. Is it thrown into the mix there? It's certainly a possibility that, that it will be taken up in that discussion but I'm just in a watching position on that discussion. So do not know. Um, and on the other things that were said, thought the idea about, you know, looking at it when people are doing the initial, in, <clears throat> excuse me, the issues report that starts out a PDP. It's a great time at the beginning to sort of say, let's look at that frame. But how you build in that framework to the existing policy work that each of the SOs and ACs does in their own way, that still needs a lot of discovery. Okay, thank you, Aubrey. Uh, Greg, you have your hand up. Thanks, it's uh, Greg Shatton for the record. And uh, just wanted to mention, uh, and this has been mentioned before in various uh, forums about uh, close generics that um, several of us, um, who are actually mostly in Naralo, or at least in North America, Alan Greenberg, myself, Kathy Kleinman, George Sadowski, uh, came together to have a, a proposal for a public interest closed generics um, framework or, or rubric, uh, try not to confuse it with the public interest framework. Uh, the idea being uh, that both the use of the generic, closed generic, and the owner or owners needed to be acting in, in the public interest and really in the, in the global public interest is, is what the uh, uh, GAC said. Uh, and we proposed somewhat of a, a co-op type of situation where if, for instance, um, disaster relief was the, uh, the top level domain, um, that not only would one disaster relief organization be able to use it, but many, and that ideally there would be some sort of consortium that would come together uh, to run uh, the TLD and, and both the members of the consortium and, and others who were vetted by the consortium would be able to uh, get um, names uh, in that space, or it might be more closed and would only be used by those in the group, but the idea would be that the group would, you know, be a broad, a broad group of of people who would be of of companies that would be, or rather, nonprofits that would be related to the uh, to the TLD in question. And it's got a lot of criticism. People couldn't get much past the idea that if it was a consortium, it wasn't really closed because there was more than one owner, and that if you were looking to possibly let others use then still it wasn't closed, but that's not necessarily the case because some of the other so-called closed generics, like I think .book, you know, there's ideas of 
that third parties would be allowed to use it. But again, it would they would be kind of you know assigned that by the owner as opposed to just applied for through a registrar. So it's it's more of a collective and selective uh, type of, uh, of of system. Uh, there were a lot of good ideas in there. There were a few not so good ideas, perhaps. The conversations at the time it was originally presented were a little, uh, you know, got stuck on the whole, is this even a closed generic after all sort of thing, and didn't get to some of the more interesting questions that we had, things that we put together regarding governance and um, accountability and oversight. Uh, but it's something to come back to um, with regard to how to... Uh, how to you know have closed generics in in the public interest, um, and without just saying that as long as it's a not for profit and they're going to use it in a good way, you know there could be you know there could be only one disaster relief and it's going to be the Red Cross, um, you know that itself raises questions, you know regardless of what you know the Red Cross obviously does a lot of work, uh, good work, but it's not the only organization out there in the disaster relief area, so it kind of gets to to questions about. Uh, you know, how to arrange the taxonomy of the internet and how hands-on um, we should all be in doing that as opposed to allowing, you know, innovation and uh, uh, third-party ideas uh, to flourish. But in any case, um, I just wanted to kind of mention that uh, our uh, half-baked or maybe three-quarters baked proposal is out there, uh, you know, to start any, and maybe to finish any discussion on closed generics. Thanks. Thank you, Greg. Uh, let's uh, move to Naila, please. Thank you for, for your comments to all of you. Thank you. Naila, you have the floor. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Eduardo. <clears throat> and it's good to be here. Good to see everyone. So I'm Naila Saras. I am the vice president looking after the North America region for the uh, ICANN stakeholder engagement team. And I'm going to give a very brief um, um, report on uh, North America space session that we held during ICANN 73, and then perhaps some of the ideas that were following up um, from the me meeting itself, and then internally we're discussing about the future of the uh, space meetings. Um, so the the purpose of the this is the second time ever that we've hold have held this space. Um, it was introduced during ICANN 72 in the in the in the October meeting last year. And then this is the second time we held it in, in March of this year. Um, the goal of this space is really to evolve and become something that um, the community helps dec uh, design and, and, and create topics that are of interest. So in the meantime, as we try to, to get this space going, we're still kind of heavily creating the topics and designing what's going in the space session. So in, this, uh, in the one we had in ICANN 73, uh, we did a quick intro on how what 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 um, activities we're carrying out. Uh, can you go to the next uh, slide, please, Michelle? So what the team is doing in order to carry out the the goals of the um, engagement plan that we worked on for the uh, last year, and this is this follows closely with the 2021-2025 ICANN strategic plan. And so to summarize that, we had a. Um, a brief uh, blog that we published earlier this year um, that we linked to and talked about, which talks about all the engagement activities that we did virtual, of course, uh, throughout 2021. And um, we talked briefly about the uh, Narello and UASG partnership that we did to offer the universal acceptance uh, training uh, class which Narello gave a much better description about during the session. So that was kind of the intro of what we did in that session. What uh, was really the highlight of the session uh, was a talk from NANOG, so the North American Network Operators Group, uh, came and gave a presentation about who they are, how they're organized, uh, their, their mission, what they do to engage, and, and, and the work that they're trying to get, to get done. Um, and NANOG and ICANN signed an MOU um, late last, sometime last year in 2021. And in it, they undertake to do um, activities together to, um, you know, to carry out both of their missions. And so this is really in. Uh, <laughs> this is an implementation of that NANOG MOU that we are working on. Um, it was Edward McNair from NANOG that uh, gave the presentation. Yes, um, they normally do a NANOG before Aaron meetings. That's right. Um, 
um, um, Eduardo and uh, Glenn, sorry. And in fact, I think they're doing, they're kind of planning something around the same time that Naralo is planning their GA. So I think around that Aaron meeting that's happening in the September, October timeframe, you you can expect to see Naralo there as well doing their meeting. So it should be a good um, a chance to catch Naralo in their meeting as well. Excellent. Thanks, Glenn. That's good. Um, so that's what Nanog did. And then uh, Naralo did a good presentation on how uh, their activities uh, for the year, for the last period since the, since the last time they reported during the space session. And then, um, as I said at the beginning, went into a little bit more detail about the universal acceptance uh, course that we did together with them and the UASG, Universal Acceptance Steering Group. So that was pretty much the bulk of the session. Um, as we discussed at the end of the session of how to evolve this, uh, there was a good suggestion, I think, from you, Eduardo, about perhaps to have uh, maybe like a keynote or a topic for the session when, we, when we're planning it to kind of focus on something. And we thought that was a great idea. So we'll be exploring mm -hmm. that a little bit further. Uh, we'll also be exploring how to um, get more involvement, perhaps like create, I know the, the Middle East session, for example, they have a, a community group that decides what topics and what to, what, to, um, what to explore at that session. So perhaps we will put something like mm -hmm. that. I don't know. It's something that we need to work more on internally and in, in consultation with the community. But also um, another discussion that's happening right now here internally is how often do we want to keep these having these sessions? Do we need to have a space session at each ICANN meeting? And do they need to be attached to the ICANN meeting or can we have them outside of the ICANN meeting? Um, so for example, in, uh, when the meeting goes to the Asia Pacific region in, um, in the September timeframe, it doesn't really make sense for us to try and have an, an, a North America space session in that time zone. So what do we do? Do we have it? Do we not have it? Uh, do we only have the session when the time zone is most, more suitable for our region? That's kind of what we're thinking of if we continue to have it at the ICANN meeting, um, uh, attached to the ICANN meeting. And as we all know, the ICANN meeting is always competing in terms of sessions and people's time. So if, you know, does it make sense to even continue to have it during the ICANN meeting? So those are the things that we are thinking about in terms of the future of first how to structure it and, um, and what topics to bring into it and then uh, where to have it, where to hold it. Uh, let's see, we have some notes here, Nanog 86, Hollywood, California, October 17 to 19. Excellent. Thank you, Alfredo. So there, and where do, Alfredo, do you know where that falls in terms of uh, the Erin meeting? I don't know if you can quickly look that up. But yeah, that's it. It's a, it seems like the October time will be a good one for a, a bunch of people to meet then at that time. Um, yeah, so that's it for me, Eduardo. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, it's, it's, uh, we were uh, we knew about this nano carrying having meetings or or before or after each other, but uh, and that's why we're doing the the GA right there uh, and next to them, not only because we want to expose some of the uh, region to their meetings, uh, but it would be a good time for networking and 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 you know talking to other organizations that are related to the uh, internet. So we're going to see how we can uh, structure the GA in such a way they can go to both meetings, but you know, we are too early uh, on the plannings. And so we will know better after, you know, time passes. Yes. Excellent. So are there any questions for Naila? If not, I think I'm next. Actually, we but do I'll... have a hand up by Greg. Uh, Greg, I think that's an old hand. I'm not hand. sure if that's an old hand or... That's a very old hand. So sad. Yes, you see, he grew up uh, gray hair there. So, so thank you, Naila, for your for your uh, uh, summary report. Uh, you know, I was going to say that having uh, North American spaces within an icon, I think it's a good idea because it's exposed the region to the work that we do here. If we do it outside the ICANN, uh, well, it will be good for the region as well. I mean, I'm not saying it's not good, but 
you will not expose our work and uh, to people that might be interested in seeing what we are looking at, because every region is is, is different. Uh, just as things were thought, you know. Yeah, thank you, Eduardo Cisnaela, uh, for the record, but thank you. That's a really great point. And I think you're right about the exposure. Otherwise it will just be another one where we're targeting the same audience. So I agree with that. Yeah. I really like that idea. Yeah, me too. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> okay, so I uh, I participated during the ICANN 73 in various sessions, but I led one and it was during an Arado call that it happens to be, uh, you know, happening to the during the ICANN 73 week. So since we were in the uh, North American region, we were allowed to have the call there. And unfortunately, it was uh, part of their ICANN schedule. So we invited, uh, uh, we put together this uh, presentation from Tom Barrett and Jeff Newman on blockchain MSTs and the centralization of domain names. We thought that uh, and that idea came from the North American School of Internet Governance, where we had so uh, uh, we started talking about this thing about decentralization of domains and blockchain, and said, well, you know, I think it's, this is something that we should start work, should start talking about. And, and and so we brought them into this call, uh, this presentation during the ICANN meeting, because again, Naila, because of the exposure. If we do this outside the ICANN meeting, probably we'll have only a very small participation. So next, next slide, please. So that's Jeff Newman, for those of you that don't know him, and Tom Barrett in the uh, uh, next after him. And, uh, uh, Jeff Newman is, has a company it's called JJ Solutions, and uh, it's a consulting company for domain names and such things like that. And Tom Barrett is uh, the owner of uh, Encirca, who is a registrar. As, I, don't know, so I don't think he's a registry, but I think he's a registrar. But in any case, he's involved with the uh, domain names, uh, domains, uh, you know, that's, that's what the company is. And he is also doing NFTs and uh, blockchain type domains and things like that. Uh, they have both have been part of the ICANN community for many, many years now. And during their presentation, uh, well, they started defining what blockchain NFTs and, and, and that, you know, what, what, that, what was that? And then once that concept was more or less explained, then they got into the decentralization of domain names and things that are happening there. Uh, so, you know, in the in the uh, realm of the blockchain and the centralization of the domain names, there are many many people that own and uh, uh, own regulated and decentralized domains. And uh, believe it or not, there are alternate routes that exist there, which we don't know. I'm not I'm not involved in in in, in that uh, you know realm, but but there are multiple routes there, and and so. My report on this presentation will provide you a little bit of the concept that they were presenting, but I'm going to try to use an analogy for some of you that do not understand blockchain because it, the concept is very simple right, to understand. The difficulty is in the implementation, you know, how you do that and how you, you know, take this thing that is uh, digital and, and make it happen and cryptographics and wallets, digital wallets and money coming here, money coming there. So I will try to do an analogy, but there is an intersection between what is physical and what is digital that is difficult sometimes to appreciate because there is an abstraction. When you talk about digital things, there's an abstraction there that you don't see, it just happened. But when you have something in your hand that you can talk, that you can touch, then you know you can see, it, you can touch it. It will talk to you, or it will do whatever. But in the digits, in the digital world, there's it's just an abstraction. So uh, next, next slide, please. So this is one of the uh, the uh, things that uh, Tom Barrett and Jim Jeff presented. It's a, it's a, to explain blockchain and and here I'm going to use an analogy, you know, to explain this thing because imagine that one of these boxes it's just a box a card a box where you put stuff in it you know you put whatever uh, pictures music uh, yourself i don't know you put it inside this box and then inside the box you take it and then you say well i'm going to send this to to other anonymous one and so you will put that in the two 
like an email to anonymous one and the from is anonymous two. So what I'm saying with this is not only you put the stuff in there because you're going to transact this with somebody, but the to and the froms are anonymous. So maybe I know you and you know me because we know each other through a different uh, uh, social media or we're friends or what have you. But the people that are looking at this, they don't know who sent what to whom. Whoops, I'm sorry, to whom. So that's one of the things that uh, this blockchain provides. It's an anony anonymity and privacy. And, and so this is a box where you put all this stuff in and imagine that you have a hook in the back of the box and another hook right in front of the, uh, of the box. And once you close this box and send it, uh, eventually there will be a chain connected to your back and that chain will be connected to the front of the previous block that happened before yours and so forth and so forth and so forth for all the transactions. So that's the concept. And that's what it's called a blockchain. It's a block of information that goes here and then is, is tied up to all the other blockchains that happen uh, sequentially. And this whole thing is becomes a ledger, just like a, a statement of a bank that you can, you know, you can see who did what, when, what transaction or what happens there. And the other thing is that it's irreversible. Once you do it, it's gone. I mean, you cannot go back and change it that we do in Facebook. Sometimes we have a typo, we go back and change it message no it's gone gone that's it anonymous and you look at the ledger and makes it open and now how this happened how this is implemented is a is a big thing I mean, this is a mathematical model uh, programmed in in many mathematical algorithms that encrypt these things give you the anonymity give you uh, secret keys the public keys and all that so by the way this thing about putting the chain behind your box and then the other box and the other box, and you will have another chain in front of your box pointing to another one. It, it doesn't happen at the moment. It, it happens, I know some of you have, have, have heard about this process of mining. And mining, you know, it takes this whole transaction in the box and then they start putting this change between, you know, in order. And they imagine that, you know, these things happening millions of times a second or millions of times a, 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 a minute all around the world. It takes a lot of computational power to do this process. This is just mathematical process and programming. And, and a lot of computer power, it translates into a lot of energy. That's what he says that when people are doing mining, it takes a lot of energy because it takes a lot of energy just to go to this, all these blocks one into another one. So that's the concept of blockchain. Very simple. Next one, please. Now, non-fungible token. Well, uh, and it says, well, non the NFTs or non-fungible tokens uh, is something that is uh, basically it's a unique digital signature. And the analogy here is I have a, if I'm painting, if I have a paint, I put my signature there, right? And that signature is my original signature and nobody can copy it. So I have an original paint. So it's a unique, a unique digital signature when we talk about digital and the paint is digital, whatever you're buying, music, a game, a video, whatever you want to be an owner of, it's a unique digital signature that says that you own that thing and nobody else. Maybe people have copies of it, but you are the one that own it. And for that, people pay lots of money. There is a, a, a Twitter a tweet there of, of uh, that uh, picture that earned, I don't know, it's too small for me to read, but it's about $28 million or something like that. Huge amounts of money people have and pay for these things. To have a digital, I mean, this is an abstraction. This is digital. There is no something physical that you can, in this example, I mean, I know this is being used to now to, uh, to buy and sell cars and things like that. There was an example of that or having a Tesla. Somebody sold the Tesla through here and then this uh, illicit, please. And then this person, uh, in order to use the, the car, he has to pay every month because I, this, the, I have to send the Tesla a special key every month so you can use it. If you don't pay me, you don't use it. You know, that's one example that was given doing uh, this. So non-functional tip tokens why the blockchain remember the blockchain that you put stuff in the box then yeah, then yeah, that's a non forgiven token whatever you put in there stays there that's a signature that's yours that's nobody's else and that's what a non fungible token is you own it 
it's an ownership type thing and, and you can trade it. Now, how this is done, I don't have an idea. Practically, you know, how you, how you buy things and do this and that. And that's one of the things we want to do next. Uh, and we'll go at the end, what it's what we want to do during August, August July time frame about this. Next one, please. So uh, at the end, uh, we got Tom Barrett that had a, 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 a long discussion about the centralized domains name. He talked about alternate routes. He showed us top level domains that he had bought in, in this place called Handshake uh, for different reasons. He said, wow, how you can buy, you know, he had dot Tom Barrett, Tom Barrett uh, and Tom something else. I, I don't remember what it was in Circa. Uh, he bought them. Uh, and the, the, if I can say positive things here, you know, there's a privacy, it's a, it's a private thing, you have privacy. It's, uh, you own the domain, you don't lease it or anything like that. There's no regulations, you just buy it. And the negative is that there are multiple routes because there are different companies selling top level domains. So you're talking now about collisions uh, on names, right? And there's no governance about, you know, your TV or, you know, what happened if I, if it, it's happened with this and that. It, it creates a, a fertile uh, uh, area for DNS abuse. So some of, this, some of some, those are some issues that this decentralization brings into the DNS. But he showed this picture and said, look, Handshake has sold already. I don't know how much they pay, but how, how much they cost, but they have sold 40 million top level domains. And then you have Icon on the left with 1500 and maybe uh, the new top level domains that will bring it to 2000 or something, I don't know. And say, look, you know, we're talking about collisions uh, with Icon and, and, and we have 40 million here and then this little blob over here. And what they did is they, they are not selling top level domains from the top 100,000 websites that use the DNS that we know. Uh, you know, if I own like a dot .gmail, but then certainly I will not sell dot .gmail in the, uh, in the uh, blockchain technology. So they, that's how they're going to manage some of that, but there's intersection there. So I ask, you know, what, how do we surf to your site? And do you need a, a what did he called web, 3.0 uh, uh, browsers, and uh, you have to know that I am in, in, hand, in the handshake network to go to your top level domain. So it's, it's not something that's going to be that transparent in the sense that how we use internet now that I put, you know, eduardodiaz.com and it will go to eduardodiaz.com. No, 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 I want now to go to eduardo at dot eduardo Diaz, okay? That goes somewhere else and probably have to use a web 3.0 browser and Really, I don't, I don't understand how that works, but that's some of this, those are, are some of the things that we want to bring in that, into that practical guide and have Tom or Jeff giving us a run on how you do this and actually surf from one place to another on how you actually buy a top level domain. domain. And uh, so it, it makes it a, a, a very interesting thing. And the fact that there are 40 million top level domains already sold in this, in this specific network, it tells you there's a lot of people interested in, in, in this or exploring ideas or doing what have you. So those are the things that we have to watch for. And the next one, please. The last one. Uh, oh, I wanted to say that uh, apparently this was a very interesting thing during the ICANN 73. Uh, we were watching the number of participants and there was an average from beginning to end of 210 participants that stayed all the way to the end and the act in the chat was active from the beginning. Uh, so I think there is a lot of interest uh, here. There was a lot of curiosity and people under, uh, can we go to the next one, please? Uh, people, I mean, we, we in ICANN, uh, you know, my take on all this is that, you know, we, the ICANN community, I'm not saying a lack only, should, should start exploring, you know, this the current DNS and how it will interact with this technology. This technology is not going to go away. And we need to understand or start understanding how these two things can work together and interact if it's going to happen. And that conversation should start now, which is which will all be uh, 
uh, we should all learn this uh, how it works and and the goal the the pros and and, and cons of of these things and uh, because it might happen like the gdpr that you know we look around and then suddenly we have the gdpr on top of us and now we're two years in an epdp that don't think you know i don't know who, what happened there so uh what is next is we're going to set up a practical uh, exercise and it's going to come sometime this summer and it will be practical as far as surfing and buying stuff and how you use a digital wallet something that you can actually touch uh that, that makes it more real than than what we was that, that that we got you know we, we saw in this presentation so thank you so much that's uh my report on this if you have any questions or comments you understood everything I said. So please, think the next one is, uh, uh, I'm not sure I don't have the agenda in front of me. Um, Jonathan, Jonathan, please, go ahead. You have the floor. Uh, hey there, Jonathan Zook for the record. Um, oh, I don't know what my, my camera is not working. Um, so, uh, thanks everyone. I have been asked to talk a little bit about, um, some of the sessions, uh, sort of random sessions, uh, that, that, that's what's under me, you know, random, uh, various participations, uh, was, uh, was what I was assigned for the ICANN uh, 73 meeting. And there, there were a number of different discussions that took place that are quite interesting. Um, one of the topics of ongoing discussion for the at-large community and for the ICANN community generally is the topic of DNS abuse. And uh, it's very interesting listening to Eduardo's presentation um, because uh, there's always been sort of a balance between unfettered uh, uh, speech and unfettered um, participation in the internet and sort of the cybersecurity and uh, consumer protection angle that the at-large community has often, um, you know, tried to support. And so it'd be interesting to see what the mechanisms for uh, DNS abuse mitigation might look like in the free-for-all world of 40 million uh, top-level domains and uh, what, what that'll look like as we work going forward. But in our own little world here of the original route, uh, if you will, with our 1500 domains, uh, there's been a lot of ongoing discussion on the topic of DNS abuse. And uh, the at-large community um, has played a significant role inside of the broader ICANN community in raising uh, the visibility of this issue because of the implications for individual uh, and users. We've held a number of different sessions, bringing up a number of important topics in the context of uh, DNS abuse. And uh, this hasn't gone unnoticed. And so there are a lot of uh, DNS abuse related initiatives that are now uh, taking place. There is a uh, DNS abuse working group within the contracted party house. There is a, a DNS abuse small team group of which uh, Justine Chu, our GNSO liaison from the at large uh, participates. There was the creation of something called the DNS Abuse uh, Institute uh, that Graham Bunton, formerly from Two Cows, is heading up. So there's a number of different um, entities that have taken up this issue. And the onus is now on us to move from the general alarm we were sounding uh, towards a more granular approach to whose responsibility um, is each sort of individual component of the problem. Uh, you know, so sort of generically yelling at the contracted parties and .org, et cetera, is less valuable than, for example, what we recently did was send um, a letter to the GNSO small team to suggest what are the areas of DNS abuse that might best be addressed um, by policy development, for example. 
Um, and so that uh, took place recently and those conversations happened during ICANN 73. The primary DNS abuse conversation that took place during ICANN 73 had to do with making the distinction between maliciously registered domains. Those are the domains that from the very start, the reason for registering them was to make use them for DNS abuse purposes, usually uh, for phishing, right? Those are domains that are designed to trick people into thinking they're legitimate domains. Um, and um, hijacked domains. And very often that's a much more subtle um, form of DNS abuse in that you have a site that is operating normally and, and for all intents and purposes, if you come to it as an individual user, it's fulfilling its normal mission. But a new page, <clears throat> farming page has been created uh, on that website. Uh, that then is pointed to by uh, a phishing attack so that you're going to a legitimate domain that you wouldn't necessarily want to shut down, um, but that's where your information is being fraudulently collected. And so how do we make the distinction between those maliciously registered domains and uh, the hijacked portion of a, a website? And, and so part of that discussion is, who's responsible as well. So if it's a maliciously registered domain, then it feels as though it's squarely um, in the remit of uh, a registrar to bring that domain down, right? That if, if, it's a, if the entire purpose of the domain is fraudulent, then that is a very straightforward, um, well, it's nothing straightforward. <laughs> I take that back, but uh, it's straightforward in terms of who we believe is responsible for taking action. But in the context of a, uh, a, a compromised domain, a hijacked portion of a website, then the web host might be uh, the better uh, candidate um, for uh, some form of mitigation. Um, we made the argument, the, and by we, I mean those of us that participated from the at-large community, um, that um, while we appreciate that distinction, we believe the number one priority needs to be the mitigation itself. That all the time that you spend trying to determine who's to blame or what the intentions were is time that the uh, individual users are still um, being subject to these phishing and farming uh, attacks. And so, that's, that's one of the challenges and one of the points of friction um, that we as representatives of the individual end user interests uh, and those that might be responsible for mitigation have is, is that um, we want to see a more immediate mitigation and anything that delays that um, we consider to be negative. Um, so to that end, one of the things that's interesting is that um, the uh, Domain Abuse Institute is soon going to be um, making available a centralized uh, domain reporting tool. I've just, pub I've just uh, pasted in the chat a link from Domain Insight on what that uh, tool is all about. But the idea will be that um, the complaints about a particular domain will be centralized and standardized so that they all have the same format, that reporters will be in some way evaluated prior to them reporting so that uh, the registrars will get sort of a cleaner feed, if you will, of complaints and be able to uh, know that they can take action right away rather than all the sort of triage of messy complaints that happen now. At this, at this point, it's just going to be complaints that are formally uh, um, evaluated that will be allowed to use this tool. So if, for example, you receive a phishing email and notice that it points to a farming page on a website, uh, your effort as an individual end user to actually determine where you should file a complaint is still going to be um, 
problematic. Uh, I've done a number of tests of late, and maybe I can share those in a future Neuralo presentation where I've documented the process as an individual user of trying to report and bring about mitigation of a uh, uh, phishing attack that I've received, uh, which is an interesting exercise uh, to uh, you know figure out who the who the host is, reaching out to the host, figuring out who needs to uh, who needs to hear about the phishing attack and the farming site. And I've actually had some success in getting um, mitigation efforts by. Um, web hosting companies for these farming sites. It's obviously a game of whack-a-mole because there's so much of that. Um, but just as a test, I wanted to see what the process was uh, involved in, um, uh, in, in tracking some of that down. The um, registrar stakeholder group is very shortly going to be offering a tool that you can go to where you put in a domain name and it'll immediately tell you who the host is. So there's some evolution going on there. There's some conversations that continue to take place. And uh, those, uh, 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 the, those DNS abuse discussions uh, continue um, uh, to this day. But it's now the job, our job, uh, is to become more granular in um, who we tried to hold responsible for various parts of the DNS abuse question. And, uh, and so we have some work, our work cut out for us in sort of directing our, our frustrations at the right uh, at the right parties. So we'll we'll continue that into conversation will continue to evolve. I'm happy to take any questions on the DNS abuse topic, or I can move on to the next session that uh, I was going to talk about. Okay, there are no hands, so you can go. Excellent, thanks, Eduardo. Uh, another session, and I and Hadi is on the call, and so she can provide a lot more information than this. But in terms of my own participation, Hadi. Uh, um, held a session that was on protecting the interests of individual um, end users uh, more broadly. And there was a series of panels. And so it was very uh, a broad topic with a lot of conversations that took place. But what I was tasked with doing was looking at the mechanisms we have for understanding what the interests of individual end users are. And I sort of divided it into uh, three categories, if you will. Um, one was just logic. In other words, because we are all ourselves, in addition to being policy wonks, we are in fact also uh, individual end users. We are in a position as a group to discuss and attempt to identify what the best interests of that community are. And so that is our primary tool, which is just our heads. Uh, trying to understand, you know, what the process is to, um, you know, buy airline tickets or do online banking and understanding, you know, what problems need to be addressed. The second level is a kind of uh, internal polling or virtuous cycle within um, our own community because we are unique in the depth of our um, community that we have. Uh, in addition to the ALAC, we have these regional at-large organizations such as Neuralo, which in turn has a series of um, uh, ALSs and uh, also individual members. And how do we broaden the conversation uh, to that broader community so that more people are sharing their experiences and their insights into what might represent the interests of individual end users. And to some extent, um, we've experimented with that form of uh, discussion uh, in the, on the topic of geographic names. Uh, we did uh, some meetings ourselves at the high level. We created a poll that was then uh, pushed out to the broader community uh, via the Rallos uh, to the ALSs and uh, we got some feedback from the broader community on the feelings on geographic names, because that's a topic where there isn't necessarily one logical answer. And it really does boil down to uh, how the majority of people feel about the issue. And so we try to do that sort of virtuous cycle as well. And uh, the third um, that we're just experimenting with now is a professionally fielded 
poll. So we had an uh, additional budget request uh, last year to uh, um, do a end user, individual end user poll. And we're going to be fielding that survey uh, shortly, probably in the next month or so, uh, to talk about the value uh, of internationalized domain names. And because it's just a pilot, we'll be talking to um, we'll be talking to folks in the uh, so-called so Hindi belt of India. So these are an area that's uh, dominated um, by people for whom Hindi is their primary or native language. And the survey will take place in that language. Uh, and we'll try to get an understanding of what motivates people uh, to use different tools on the internet, whether it's apps versus browser, uh, et cetera, and see what role internationalized domain names might play in that. And so that will literally be a survey of individual end users and not the folks that have sort of self-selected to be um, uh, you know, uh, participants in these conversations. And so those are the three levels of conversations that can take place uh, to kind of determine the interests of individual end users. And uh, that's what I spoke about as part of um, uh, Hadia session. So those are the two big ones that I wanted to mention. And I hope that's helpful. Again, happy to answer any questions, but uh, I'm sure I've blown past my 11 minutes. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thanks to you, uh, uh, Jonathan. Are there any questions for Jonathan? If I don't see any hands, uh, Greg, you are, our, you are our last speaker and uh, this floor is yours. Thanks, it's Greg Chatton. Um, again, for the record, I don't want to take too much time because we only have a few minutes, um, but I'm glad to be on the agenda uh, this time. What I'd like to talk about briefly are the uh, bilateral sections that the uh, ALAC and at-large community uh, participated in. Um, these are sessions where we're, we, as a group, are one-on-one -on -one with one of the other um, major ICANN um, organizations, uh, stakeholder organizations, or um, advisory committees like ourselves. Uh, some of these have been regular over the last at least few years, um, or at least a couple of years. All of these have been uh, taking place because of the energy of, and efforts of not just uh, ALAC and at large generally, but, but specific individuals. Uh, so we've had a very successful series of bilateral uh, discussions with the GAC. Um, and that continued um, at ICANN 73. Uh, we, uh, and uh, Iro Lansipuro has been uh, coordinating that. I believe he is now um, taken out of that role. And if, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe it's uh, Satish Babu uh, who will be coming in and doing that from, from now on. Uh, but that, this is an important uh, thing to do since, uh, uh, you know, our influence and our you know, maturity as an organization in part depends on sort of who we're talking to and who will talk to us and who we will team with in order to try to uh, help um, move along uh, both policy and uh, other um, issues within, within the ICANN space. Um, after a, uh, a hiatus, we were back with a bilateral uh, with the GNSO, uh, which was once upon a time sort of my home. Um, and uh, that's important because ultimately, if we're talking about GTLD policy, um, all roads essentially lead to the GNSO Council. Uh, so it's very important for us to have um, a, a relationship with the Council, at least a relationship of um, equals, um, in a sense. We, of course, have a, uh, a liaison on the GNSO Council uh, for the last number of years that had been uh, Cheryl Langdon or it's currently uh, Justine Chu, uh, which is a uh, uh, a great um, a great pair of of people for that that role there. But it's good to have the the bilaterals um, in there. Um, I may be missing a bilateral, but it's four twenty eight anyway, and uh, I don't want to go too much longer. But I think this is overall a very important um, effort for us um, to be seen. Um, I've been corrected that uh, it's actually not Satish who's the GAC liaison, or not Satish who's now the GAC liaison, it's uh, uh, jo Joanna Kalesha. Um, so um, that uh, 
also also great. Uh, Joanna's from from Poland, um, uh, from Łódź, not far from where my grandfather was born. Actually, not far from where my father was born. Sorry, I'm not that old. Um, in any case, um, all, all important things. And you know, one last um, comment that I'd, I'd like to make is that there was obviously a lot of discussion about DNS abuse. Um, I knew that if I was coming after Jonathan Zuck, I would not be the one who would primarily be discussing DNS abuse. Um, but I think it's important to note that while there are a lot of discussions, um, there are there's still a you know, fundamental rift between certain parts of the community and others as to the, the breadth of DNS abuse. Um, some might think we spent too much time fighting about how to broaden or narrow uh, the definition of DNS abuse. Uh, but you know the efforts continue on the part of, I, I would say, the contracted parties to define it as narrowly and as technically as possible, um, and efforts by by at large and and other groups um, are look to look to define it more broadly, especially where there are um, issues that um, essentially stoke DNS abuse, um, but are not, uh, but but might seem more like uh, so-called content abuse instead, but uh, Really, there's it's kind of a a bait and switch, if you will, or it's a you attract people with content and then smack them with the abuse. Uh, that's something that we need to work on, and we need to communicate, you know, with others. Uh, at the same time, as taking what we can get with the efforts that are underway and that you know have broad uh, buy-in from the contracted parties and others, such as uh, the DNS Abuse uh, Institute, um, which is now headed by uh, Graham Bunton, formerly of of Two Cows. Um, which I think in part is intended to advance the ball on DNS abuse and in part to try to, try to keep a tight fence around the definition of, of DNS abuse. So um, a bit of a double-edged sword uh, there. Um, and you know, I respect Graham very much, but clearly it's a contracted parties sponsored organization and it needs to be uh, taken with a grain of salt. Um, so that's it for kind of general uh, observations. Um, and if anybody else has anything to say about the, uh, the bilaterals, especially since I might have missed one, it's important. But I look forward to having more bilaterals in The Hague. And I think it's incredibly, it'll be incredibly much better to have them face to face uh, because there'll just be that much more real interaction and a chance to, to get to know people across the community, which I think is, is one of the absolute keys to uh, how you how effective you can be in helping to advance uh, policies and and interests, and it's been awful hard to get and to know anybody better than than you did over the last couple of years. Thanks very much. Back to you, Greg. Thank you so much, and uh, I want to thank also all the presenters during the. What is this? I'm sorry, it's making noise. Uh, give me one second, please. Okay, thank you. I, I Maureen wanted, is going down. Uh, Maureen, <laughs> yeah, I didn't know Maureen was here. So, so thanks for attending, Maureen. Uh, uh, and just, uh, you know, uh, I wanted to have a chance with all our, our allied representative uh, to report their, their, you know, their feelings and uh, what they talked about during the ICANN 73. I think it's important for the region to, to hear all of us and what happened in ICANN 73 because, uh, you know, some of us don't have the time or cannot attend these meetings. So thank you, Greg, uh, Jonathan, uh, Marita that is not here, myself, I say myself too, and Naela. And if I'm missing someone, uh, next time, by the way, we're going to have uh, Denise uh, from the social media uh, at the beginning of our next meeting, uh, which is going to happen in May, uh, to talk a little bit, uh, a, a report on the social media uh, numbers for ICANN 73 and the results there. So thank you so much. And uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. The meeting is adjourned. Please take care. Bye, all. Bye, all.